Most people think banks are very sophisticated and they have plans for everything. The reality is, especially in the London investment banking sector, it is actually not sophisticated at all. The people that is traders themselves are sophisticated. They come from good schools and have strong backgrounds. However, banks have invested very little money since the 80s and 90s in infrastructure and software development. Even routers was made in 1975, probably the biggest FX platform in the world. Banks don't invest much in their people either because the turnover is very huge. They don't really know who is going to leave when. So basically, you're pretty much left alone with your instincts and gut feelings. Sitting here every day, when things go badly, if you can't uh, keep your cool at that time, you've got no chance to be perfectly honest. But there are ways to learn from the older traders. They are usually there to mentor the new traders. In a bank, most people think there are around 500 traders when they see pictures of a large trading room. But the truth is, most of these people are in measures and acquisition, equity and sales department. In the largest FS bank, which is Deutsche Bank, at the moment there is about 70 FX traders. The purpose of this video is for you to get a sense of how big banks actually take their positions and what they actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. We see a lot of conspiracy theories about how all the big banks are out there to get you and how they've got this obsession of getting the most out of every single person and it's just not how it is. Even among the big banks, currency trading and dealing is a competition amongst them. It is a kill or be killed environment. Cable Chemical Hong Kong, 49.54. In London, Richard quotes a competitive price to tempt William into buying. And William falls for it, buying five million pounds. Lose five. Five million of Barclays pounds have just traveled to Chemical Hong Kong. As Richard sells more, the price falls. And within 10 minutes, it's down half a cent. The five million pounds that William bought is now worth 20,000 pounds less. In this small duel, Richard has scored. William is gracious in recognizing a competitor's skill. Well, it's a good deal. It's quite good. Why do you say that? Uh, well, sometimes uh, you, can, you can see a scream, he can lead the market. The banks have not formed any trading cartel business where their sole objective is to take retail money as most are made to believe. We all at a point have had the view that banks are super sophisticated and great knowledge and information and scientific method for why they do things and that's not the case either. Banks don't use technical analysis with any sort of mechanical systems in place. The truth is, banks use very little technical analysis. The main reason is, the bank is the market making exchange. That is, the place where prices are being made. Without the banks, there are no prices in the market. So if you're a market maker, if you're a price maker, you can look at historical data and make up a price code of events that are happening right now. Banks rely predominantly on customer flow, which is now best known as order flow. Customer flow or order flow at the end of the day is what translates into price action. One of the main reasons why traders in the bank can't trade intraday is because constantly customers are taking prices from you and you don't have the luxury of a time to be looking at the Fibonacci or the historical chart. Average trading rate of a Euro USD trader is about 10 to 15 deals in a minute when it is really moving, so a dealer doesn't have the time to look at things or even the chart. But if he's a good trader, he will do some morning preps and prepare some good scenarios for the market with different outcomes in case the data might come out or whatever might happen. I think cable will lead the way down again to the cable down to dollar mark to 306. Who is that? Nintendo? Check. The difference basically is, while these trades from customers flow in, all he does is buy at some predetermined level that he thought about in the morning. With Richard's opening gambit over, an even bigger player is entering the market, trying to buy £20 million with its Deutschmarks. 
Perhaps it needs these millions to buy a lot of British goods. But more likely, the Russian, otherwise known as Boris, in reality the Bank of Foreign Trade Moscow, is speculating that the pound will rise. Richard calls Moscow direct to find out what's going on, prefacing his message with the customary, hi, hi, friends. They could easily be bluffing him. They could be buying a little to push the price up before selling a lot. John, I think the Russians buying sterling marks elsewhere now. But Richard guesses that they must be buying from other banks too in a big operation as the pound begins to rise. Thanks. Hear that? Richard thinks Boris is buying sterling marks elsewhere. So he decides to risk jumping on their bandwagon using the other traders to ring out and get prices so they can hit the market with tens of millions as quickly as possible. 50-55. We're going to buy a bit of sterling. It looks, like, it looks like everybody in the market might be a bit short of sterling. It doesn't want to go down. 58-63. Take five. His first five million pounds, and with each wave, he buys another five million. <laughs> Quickly, so I'll go up in a second. 58-68. A grimace as the price rises. 57, Take five. 57, Take five. What positions have I run? 58, 65. Take five. 58, 65. Take five. That'll do. That'll do. He's bought 35 million pounds. Richard and the Russians between them have helped the pound up half a cent. But now taking the profit proves irresistible, so Richard starts selling. If you're looking for an offer, you've got it. If you're looking for an offer, you've got to my daddy, you're five, how many years? 20 points probably. Between 18, 18 and 90, I want to sell. Sorry. 1995! Yours! Yes. A brief speculative bubble has burst, but Richard has won again. Uh, as you saw, we bought 35 million pounds, we went up 30 points, we decided to take our profit. So how much money did you make on that little bubble? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. The trader usually doesn't even know exact size because of the customer deals always flowing in. You never actually know your position exactly in the bank because there is no software developed for this. An average trade is anywhere from $50 million to $250 million. Most pound and euro USD traders carry positions around $200 million and $300 million. And that's basically to cover the customer flow. If he wants to put on a large position, it has to be around half a billion, that is $500 million. Seventy-five thousand pounds. How much? About seventy-five thousand pounds. That took you about half a minute. The price just took about three minutes. Yeah. Uh, Eighty eighty-five. He's the best in the world because he said he has learned his trade. Um, the hard way. He started getting the sandwiches when he was uh, in his early 20s and he was kicked about by the other dealers and um, he has no um, ego whatsoever. If he's wrong, he knows he's wrong, he will cut out and he will say, I had enough, I'm not going to beat the market and he's there to, um, to work for Barclays Bank, not for his ego. That's why he's so good. So the next time you hear anybody try to sell you an idea or any sophisticated and mechanical process of how banks really trade, Better refer them to this video and help them learn properly. There are a lot of YouTube videos about how banks trade and the whole focus is driven on some technical indicators or some magical institutional candlesticks which makes no sense. The new order of the day is to get a regular retail trader ask you if you trade institutional way or retail way which in fact is very laughable. If you enjoyed this video and it made much sense to you and you learned something new, make sure to smash the like button, share this video with your friends and subscribe to this channel. I'll bring you informative video like this next time.